let's continue and look at the boundary conditions. So, we have different kinds of boundary conditions. The one that we have not yet touched, that is a stationary solid wall. So, in our case, that would mean that the boundary condition that we have for that will be will happen at the stationary wall. And imagine we are now thinking of the one-dimensional case. Imagine we have a, a closed end of the, a pipe. Flow is coming and it's facing the wall. That means at that point we have to set the velocity equal to zero. So the velocity at the wall is equal to zero. So remember we are one deep. If this were 2D, we can, can have slipped along the wall. That's a different story. We are talking here about 1D. So we have the following thing. We imagine that we have our domain, and we are at the very end of the domain. And we, uh, here we have our cell NJ. And here we have a wall. So there. So so if we would have um, T here, for example, if we would look, look at the characteristics, then we have here the wall. So that means when the flow comes here, it cannot penetrate. The velocity there must be zero. So that means we assume then that we have here the interior and, uh, of, of our domain, and we have here the wall that is at the end of the domain. So how can we do the calculations there? Well, there are different ways. A simple way would be uh, first to think what will be the flux. We need the flux there. The flux is easy in a sense because all flux contributions will be zero because most of them depend on the velocity. Rho u in the continuity equation, the rho hu, the, the uh, flow of uh, total enthalpy in the energy equation, all will be zero. But in the momentum equation, we will have P, the pressure. So we need the pressure at the wall. So a, a simple approximation could be when we have the pressure in the cell, we use that. That would be one way. Another way, which is uh, probably better, is to assume so-called reflection conditions uh, by introducing a ghost cell. And we do that by adding a cell in the, the spirit, say, that we did also for the periodic boundary conditions, but here in a different sense. We imagine that we have here the ghost cell ghost cell Nj plus 1. So, and uh, how can we do that? We imagine now that when we have here the wall, and we have here, for example, we have the velocity here. So the velocity here is that is the cell Nj, say Nj, and we have here the Nj plus 1. We are working only here. So we imagine we have a velocity that is going this direction. In order to get that to zero, we set the velocity here opposite. We set the velocity just the, the negative value of that. So that's, that is for the velocity. For the pressure and the density, we assume that the pressure here is also the pressure here and also for density. So we do the following reflection conditions. They are symmetric for the density, so there we simply take the values, then, uh, sorry, it's the other way around, nj plus 1 equal to nj, and for the velocity is what we just discussed, we, have, we are anti-symmetric, 
get the velocity then at the wall to be zero. And for the pressure, we are symmetric as well, like for the pressure, for the density. So, so if we do that here, then we have defined values in the cell nj plus 1, and we can compute our flux with our favorite um, <coughs> flux uh, Riemann solver. If we would need muscle, we would also we could also define an another cell by using the cell here nj minus 1 to define the cell nj plus 2. So if we do it that way, then the numerical flux function that we like can be used also at that phase, at that boundary actually. So the numerical flux function can be evaluated in that case um, at uh, the wall, in our case it would be the in our case, it would be the, uh, the Nj plus one half as for an interior phase. So that is the nice property using ghost cells that you can make life in a sense easier, but you have then to introduce that and you have to up update it. So when you do a time step, you get new values in the cell NJ, and then you update the values in the ghost cell, like that. So then, this is easy. More difficult, actually, are the boundary conditions that we have at inflow and outflow. Or could we also say artificial boundaries, like in our case, for exercise 5, the boundaries are essentially artificial ones. And in our case, we just want the, the waves to go out. We stop, we stop actually the time before they go out. If you see your shock propagating beyond the, um, the right boundary, you have probably computed the delta x wrongly. Delta x in our case for exercise 5 is 2 divided by nj. That's just a side remark, but there the wave just should go out without reflection. But when we have really something that is entering, something leaving, so when we have, uh, then uh, we can look at that in a more general way. So that brings us then to the inflow and outflow. So, and uh, the boundary conditions that we have there, inflow and outflow, I use this acronym, boundary conditions BCs. Um, they can be determined from the characteristic form. was actually the equation that we derived before, as it was equation 14, there we had the vector of the characteristic variables, capital W, plus the eigenvector matrix lambda, capital lambda, times space derivative of the characteristic variable vector W is equal to zero. And the interesting thing is to look at the, each equation for each of the characteristics. 
And that is, as we said, equivalent to looking at the health component of that characteristic variable vector. So it's the health characteristic variable, then, and we have the three of them. And here we have then the characteristic speed, it's the health eigenvector, times the space derivative of the health eigen of the characteristic variable. So that is equal to zero. So in that we have for in our case for L from 1 to 3. And we have seen what these look like. And we have also argued that on the characteristics, the um, characteristic variables are zero. So that is the WL, uh, the time the change is zero, or the, the WL, let's see, we, we did it, say, I do it now in this quick way, WL, the change in WL is zero on the characteristics, on the characteristic uh, XL of T, which is defined, uh, the characteristic is defined as by the slope of this curve in time, and that is the characteristic speed lambda L. L is equal to 1, 2, and 3. So, and then we can look at that in more detail, and we saw then the characteristic variable W1 does not change on the characteristic 1, 2, W2 on 2, and W3 on 3. But we had also um, said more simple, simple expressions for that by multiplying these characteristic variable changes by certain numbers. So that, and that led then to the following, that we had the uh, quantity that I now call the R1, and it is the pressure change minus rho C times the velocity change. That is zero on the characteristic number one. So the W1 is, uh, does not change, but when we multiply that by any uh, constant, it is the same. And we have done it such that we more easily see what is going on. Here we have a pressure change, here we have a velocity change, it's multiplied by the density and the speed of sound. So that is on the characteristic number one, on x1 t. And on the characteristic number two, we have the pressure change minus the speed of sound squared times the density change is zero on the characteristic x2. And on the characteristic three, the pressure change and then plus, here we have minus, here we have plus rho c, the velocity change is zero on characteristic number three. So that means when we want to know what is going on, we have to look at the characteristics. And then we see, we get information. So, and that is then, let's see, the characteristic that is, um, well, if we define the, 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 four, the, the three characteristics, then the number one is the D x1 of t dt is if we now look what we have we have the lambda 1 that was the acoustic wave going opposite to where the velocity goes so that is the u minus c the characteristic number 2 is described by the slope of the velocity itself and the characteristic number 3 is defined by the slope where u where C goes in with the, with the plus, the U, U plus C. So they are defining the uh, characteristics. And we look now at these characteristics at the boundaries. That is the recipe. So look at characteristics at boundaries.
So then we can have this situation here. So we have x and t. We are here at the boundary. So here we have the boundary of our domain. Now we have to do a convention. And for the discussion now, we take the convention that we assume that we have the interior here to the left. Interior and that we have the exterior to the right. That means that we compute to the left of the boundary. And then we have to see from where do the characteristics come. So if we are at a point in time, say we imagine this is the old time but that we know, this is the new time, so this is delta t. So then we ask ourselves where do the characteristics come from? And now if we assume now as an example here that the velocity is larger equal to zero and smaller than the speed of sound, then the characteristic u minus c will be negative. So that will be negative. So that means characteristic one will have a negative slope. So that we assume maybe like that. So that will be the characteristic number one. It's defined by this. So and on this characteristic, we say that the dr1 is, does not change. So on this characteristic, the dr1 is zero. We know that. Okay. And, um, but what, what does that tell us? It tells us that information is entering the domain from outside. We don't know that. So that means we have to give an information here because we cannot retrieve that information. So we have to give a boundary condition for R1 in that case. So give boundary condition for R1 or something else. So in that case, we could then say we have if we have if we know what is the exterior, say we have uniform flow or stagnant flow or whatever, we have some information on that, then we can use that row u from that, what we know, and then we can, we need then information about p. <coughs> this combination we can relate to what is happening here. So we get, we get some relations at the exterior, we need some information here, and we get then one equation for the <coughs> pressure, for example, for example, you could do it like that, that you say the pressure minus the pressure, that would be, if we call the exterior here infinity, P infinity minus rho C at infinity, then we have U minus U infinity is equal to zero. So then we would get one relation. That would be one way. If you have a problem where you have flow in a channel, and you have this, this is your outflow boundary, then you could use the pressure, the ambient pressure. So that would be like that. Uh, or, say, so that would be one way to give the boundary condition for R1, or um, give the pressure equal to PA, ambient pressure. That would be another possibility. But you have to give some information. You need some information. This tells you one characteristic is coming from outside. You need to give something. Now characteristic two. It's u. U is uh, positive. It can also be zero, but assume, assume it's positive. So then we are say here. So that would be the characteristic number two. And on that we know that the d R2 is constant. It doesn't change. So dr2 is zero on that. This condition here is the same as to say that the entropy is constant. So the entropy, if you want to have that here, we can get down here to the old time level. If we know it here, we know it here. 
Or we can do the same thing as we did here. We assume, say, that we are here, if we are here in the cell, if this is the cell NJ, this last cell, let's assume this is the cell NJ. Then we can take the velocity. If we know the average, we just take that. Uh, we could also, well, we cannot do that. We could also try to get higher order, but it's good enough to assume that we just take the, um, the average that we have here in the cell, and we get the entropy from that, and we take then the entropy from that, and then we know the entropy at this point that we need at the boundary is the same as we have here in the cell NJ. That would be one way. <coughs> Then we have, uh, so that means we have here, we do not, we must not give a boundary condition here, but we can evaluate our variables from the knowledge that we have in the domain. So here, no boundary condition is needed. So, no boundary condition for R2, and the same is true for the R3, because we have also Say that would be the number 3, and on that the dr3 does not change. So also there, no boundary condition is needed, because they are coming from the inside of the domain where we know what is going on. We can argue the same way. On the characteristic 3, we know this. Then we could take uh, we can relate the pressure difference here at the boundary and here in the cell NJ. Here we would take the row C in the cell NJ and U we would take this difference here. Difference that we don't know and the U in the cell that we know. So then we would get three equations for our unknowns at the boundary. And then we can determine that. So what we see from here is, from this example, when you look at the characteristic, find out which characteristics come from the inside of the domain. In our case, number two and number three. Those you can compute. You can compute then, say, these Riemann invariants or some other quantities. You can compute them from inside. And no boundary condition must be given. But for the characteristics that enter the domain, that enter the boundary from the exterior, you have to give a boundary condition. There the flow kind of now what is coming in, you have to tell it. So there you have to give a boundary condition. So that is, that is then for the entering characteristics. So that is the, the golden rule. The look at the characteristics, find out which are um, going into the domain from the exterior and which leave the domain from the interior. And then for the entering ones, you give boundary conditions. For the, for the ones that leave the domain, uh, you don't need that. You can, can compute that, the values from inside. So that is the basic story here. So I call that outgoing characteristics. X L of T. Determine that it would be in our case it would they would leave here the domain. Determine the corresponding Riemann invariant from the interior. And for incoming characteristics that is coming from outside, from the exterior, for incoming characteristics, RL as boundary condition. In 
some cases, like discussed here for the outlet pressure, you can also sometimes, or sometimes it's more physically more relevant to give some other quantity. But this gives you the basic information. So this is very important that you have that in mind, and you can read more about that in the lecture notes and also in the book. You see, we have uh, essentially four cases. I discussed only one case here. I discussed the subsonic outflow. So this case that I discussed here was the subsonic outflow. You could have supersonic outflow when everything is getting out. You can compute everything from inside. You could have subsonic inflow so that the flow is coming from this direction. Then this characteristic would come on this side. So then you would have to give values not only on R1 but also on R2. And if you have um, um, supersonic inflow, in our case uh, the exterior would be to the right. All information would come from the right. You have to give all information. You have to then you have to give um, R1, R2, R3, or you could give simply the complete um, vector of the conserved variables. U, rho, rho, u, rho, e, or rho, u, and p, as you like it, it doesn't matter. So you have these four cases. Question? Yes. Uh, is R the residual? No. R is here the Riemann, the Riemann invariant. I define it here. The change in R is defined like that. Okay. That is the, it is the characteristic variable change dw1 multiplied by a certain constant. I just call it here r, and r here means Riemann invariant. Maybe I can tell that. So r here does not mean residual, thanks for that. So, but it's Riemann invariant. That is a quantity that is constant on characteristic L, XL. Therefore, this characteristic formulation is uh, very important. We have now seen it already now <coughs> two times today with the stability analysis to get a scalar equation to do the stability analysis on that and compute them for the system and here for the boundary conditions. So, you can, as I said already, more, read more about that in, in the lecture notes and also in, in the book. We want to move on and leave the Euler equations and get to the more complex one equations than the Stokes equations. That is then the finite volume method for the one dimensional Navier Stokes equations. Now we have the Euler fluxes that we know how to treat, but we will also have, in addition, the Lisker fluxes. <coughs> so let's see. So what we need here is, um, if we have the want to have the finite volume method for that, then we would have a, a d u j d t and then we would have to compute the fluxes say if I would do that now in the way that I like with the residual I would take it on the right hand side 1 over delta x j then we would have the fluxes here we would have now I call the Euler fluxes f c j plus 1 half Fcj minus one half. 
So, and what is changed here is now that we will, that was what we did, we had this before. We had this before, that was what, what we had before the Euler equations. Now we redefine that. We use that still, but now we say where the flux vector f now consists of the uh, Euler flux minus the viscous flux. So let's see, I think that would be 26, 27. So that would be the basic thing. And then we define our flux, our total flux now. So with the inviscid flux, it's from the Euler flux function. And that is called, the, I call it now FC. And that is containing the ones that we are dealing with for the exercise 5. We have rho u, rho u squared plus p, and rho e plus p times u. So that, that we have full control of now. And now you're getting more of that when finishing exercise 5. And we have the inviscid, the, the viscous flux function. And let me write that here. That is the now you could essentially go back to the introduction of the course where you actually derive the Nano Stokes equations and look for the 1D case. In the 1D case, we have still nothing in the continuity equation from viscous terms, it's just zero. For the momentum equation, we get here a full third times the viscosity times the du dx in here. That is from the, the viscous um, forces entering the, the momentum equation. And then the work done by those viscous forces, it is that multiplied by u. That is the four third mu, u dx times u. And it is the heat conduction, which is the thermal conductivity, k, um, times the temperature derivative, dt dx. So that will be then our viscous flux function. And they are approximated now at the faces. So let's see where f with that and so and so on. We continue this the sentence are approximated by. And then we could take, for example, uh, we could take the, um, let's see, that would be the 28, that we say the convective flux, uh, J plus one half, is approximated, that is the, it's also containing, it's not purely convective, it also contains the pressure, as you see. You could use here actually the central finite volume method because we are going to use a smooth problem, and there we do the flux, we compute the um, this Euler flux as we did for the other methods with the value in the cell J and the value in the cell J plus 1. And here we stop. We didn't use the C before. Now we use it to distinguish between the convective or inviscid flux and the viscous flux. So what, is, what we do here is we, are, we would use the central finite volume method. So that is here we would use the central. You could also use the Rosanov method or the Rho method or whatever you like. 
And the FV is approximated in the following way. Let's see, so if we keep this here in mind, this uh, finite volume formulation. So we continue, it's approximate by, and the, the viscous flux function is approximated in the following way, and that we approximate like the heat, like we did the heat conduction for the heat equation by central approximation of the derivatives. So we approximate then these guys here, and then we get zero, that is easy. We assume now for simplicity that uh, mu is constant. It's not necessary, otherwise we would use some arithmetic or harmonic mean. We have discussed that, that is not the point. And then we would do the discretization here at the phase using the values in j plus 1 and j. And for the velocity, u is the velocity, uj plus 1 minus uj divided by the distance between them, that is so these are then our self-averaged velocities, and these are then the midpoints in the cells. It's just the same as we did for the, for the heat equation. There we had here the, the alpha, and the u was the, the temperature. Otherwise it's the same. And now we play a little trick here. We replace this here by the derivative of u squared half. Ah, so we do this here. Take the u squared with respect to x to the one half in front. If you take this derivative here of u squared dx, you get 2u du dx. And the 2 is cancelled with that. So we replace that then. So the, this third, so this term here, let's see. Um, so this term here then becomes then with this two, it becomes two third mu is then the derivative of u squared dx. See that? So then we can easily do a discretization on that. And we get then here two third mu, and then we take the difference approximation by taking the u j plus one squared minus the u j squared divided by the distance. So then we have the discretization of this. That is the work done by the viscous forces. And then we have to take the heat conduction into account. Again, we assume that the thermal conductivity is constant. And then we have here the temperature in the cell j plus 1 minus the temperature in the cell j divided by the distance of the midpoints. So that would be then our discretization by the central finite volume method for the derivatives. Okay, so then we know how to do discretization. And um, then we have to do the stability. The stability we can analyze for uh, what we also did when we looked for the stability for the Van Cutter method. So we check the stability for uh, our finite volume method applied to the convection diffusion equation. So that's our model equation because it contains both convection and diffusion. So it looks like that. We have now a scalar to make things easier. We have an affection speed A, the x derivative. On the right hand side, we have some uh, viscosity coefficient B and a second derivative. And you can make life easier when you use the spectral radii here for our problem. So A, we take the maximum uh, 
that we have for our problem, u plus c, the maximum is here for uj, that is meant here. So, we write that, then we just write like that, j here. So, and that is the spectral radius, the largest absolute value of eigenvalue of the inviscid Jacobian matrix D, F, D, U. U is capital U here. And the B, that turns out to be the maximum of two values, four third, that is coming from the viscous contribution, and gamma divided by the frontal number, we had that in the beginning of the course, times mu, our um, viscosity divided by density. So we have assumed here that they are constant, so we don't need to say any more. And that is the spe spectral radius of the Jacobian of the viscous flux function, which we have on the left, with respect to the first derivative of u. So, and then we can very easily do this analysis as we discussed already for the um, Ramakata methods and then it is a matter of um, just checking that the lambda that we get from doing computing the Fourier symbol doing the spatial discretization that this lambda that we get times delta t must be inside the stability domain of our ODE method and that is the same thing as to say that the amplification factor is smaller or equal than 1. So to check that, for typically round cutter method, would be quite tedious, but to check that the lambda, the Fourier symbol times delta t, is inside the stability domain of the TPD round cutter method is easy. And what we get out of that is then stability, uh, stability conditions of the following kind. So, for in our case, for our central finite volume method that we have been discussing here, and the TBD Ramakata method third order in time, we would have the stability, or we can use the stability condition. Bound it as we discussed for the Rangakata mat, we could bound the in the real and the imaginary parts, but we could also combine it, and then we would have the A delta T divided by delta X, that is our essentially the current number. But now we find this here plus four times V, and V is then taking into account the viscous effects and the heat production. So this here times delta t divided by delta x squared should be smaller or equal around 1.5. So that would be then for that and for the explicit Euler method the stability bound is lower and you will get this information then for exercise 6. Okay, but this shows you once you have a method for the other equations, you can also use ruler of method instead of the central method, but for this problem where everything is smooth, the central method will be more accurate. So once we have that, we put, we add the viscous flux, and that's it. And what we can do with that, we can compute then the shock structure, because we have this property inside the shock. So we can get the details of that, which has viscous effects. Okay, so we...